Hello out there in YouTube land, this is Moist Man, and as always, I thank you for coming to my channel. I appreciate you guys, your subscriptions, your ongoing support, and your comments. Today I'm going to do a quick special video on songwriting in the music industry as it is today. And let me just say this first. The purpose of my channel is to actually kind of give back and teach the young guys that want to play the stuff from my era. And when I first got on YouTube, I found the gentleman by the name of uh, Plum Dog. And I kind of more or less dedicate my channel to Plum Dog. Plum Dog is an older black guy that played a lot of IG Brothers stuff and taught me some stuff. And he was one of the few black older guys that were actually doing this because YouTube seemed to be flooded with a lot of rock and roll and rock stuff, which is cool. You know, but it's like, where's our representation? Where are our people that are going to teach us or teach the younger folks this great music? So I'm hoping that I'm doing uh, my channel justice and filling in the gap because that's what I want to do. That's my purpose, basically, on, on YouTube and, and to do some other things like talk shows, which I have another talk show. Click on the link and subscribe to that. It's called Tell It Like It Is. And also uh, some short films I've done because, you know, I kind of like to do a lot of different things. So I'm going to touch on this issue of today's music because I was watching a video from uh, Scarface, the rapper from the Ghetto Boys. And he's one of my all-time favorite rappers. And he said something that was just so interesting because I said, I've been saying this for the, for the last year. And he hit, it on the, hit the nail on the head. Uh, he entitled his topic... Who stole the soul? And what he was talking about is where are the black bands? You know, first of all, where are the rock black bands? They're non-existent. And just where are the regular R and B bands? You know, because he he pointed out, and I said the same thing on one of my videos prior. Uh, our rock counterparts are still doing their thing. Their group of white guys playing rock, which is great. But where are the group of black guys doing R and B and have a band? like mint condition, but they're not new. They've been around for 20 years. So the question again I pose is, where are the black bands? And initially on the surface, people might say, well, black guys don't want to play instruments. They just want to rap and, and they want to make beats. And uh, that's partially true, but then partially it's not. We follow the trend. You know, if there's a, a, the, a supply or demand for rappers, of course, a group of guys are going to try to do that. But here is my, I guess, analysis of that. And I think that Scarface would agree with me. The music industry is kind of trying to kill black groups. And here is the reason why. It's not so much a racial thing. It's a financial thing. It's much easier to pay one guy to be a solo artist and then go pay two other guys to produce and put his album together. Because nowadays, usually like two or three guys put the whole album together. You know, with synthesizer layers and drum beat loops. But if you look at some of these old Rick James album covers and Confunction and Gap Band, you'll see that usually at least 20 to 30 people have played on this one album. You know, that's a lot of musicians. And you can tell uh, the quality because you can tell by the quality that, you know, they brought in conga guys, percussionists, keyboard players, guitar players, horn section. Nowadays, again, the industry is trying to be cheap with us. And just basically uh, hire or sign one guy as an artist and bring in two other guys to produce the whole album. You know, so it's unfortunate that the music industry is, is literally killing black groups and black music. And I'm hoping that some of these young folks take notice of, you know, this video and say, you know what, you're right. When I was growing up and my dad used to listen to Marvin Gaye and, and the Funk Brothers and Confunction and the Gap Band. Now I listen to nothing but solo artists, you know, R. Kelly, Neo, or Genuine. So we have, where are the black bands? So I'm hoping that, you know, someone says, you know, enough of this. Give us our due. Don't choke off our, our music and, and let it die. You know, so that's kind of my rant on that. But now I'm going to kind of touch on the aspect of songwriting. Uh, just the other day I was listening to a, uh, a song by Rihanna which is Chris's, Chris Brown's ex-girlfriend. It's called Rehab. like the song, and one reason why I liked it, because it reminded me of a song I wrote back in the late 80s called Don't Kill the Baby. And it's, that song was basically about uh, a guy who was involved with a woman. She got pregnant, and uh, without his knowledge, she went ahead and had an abortion, and he was upset about that. 
you know, and it, that was a song that's kind of set on the shelf for me because there was no way that nobody was going to be ballsy enough to take it and record it because I wrote that back in the late 80s and they weren't ready for stuff like that, you know. Unfortunately, uh, they try to pigeonhole uh, black artists where they want you to just write about, I love you. I got to have you back. I'm sorry I did wrong. I do better. You know, and there's nothing wrong with those songs, but... You know, we have more of a voice than just, I see you in a smoky disco, I'm trying to get at you. You know, so, again, uh, they weren't ready for that song, so it just sat on the shelf. But what I noticed about the song was, uh, it only had like four chords. And it's a seven minute and 35 second song. Now, I'm sitting here listening to this song, and I'm like, when is the change coming? You know, when is the bridge in the song coming? And unfortunately, a lot of these songs today don't have that, don't know what it means. I mean, if you want to be a good songwriter, the more chords you have in your song, the more expression. It's kind of like this example. You can articulate more when your vocabulary is larger. If you only know four words, you can't communicate very well. And it's kind of the same thing with music. Uh, if you listen to the great songwriters and recent come to mind is Babyface because I love his compositions. Study them. You know, Babyface has what you call in the song a B section to the verse, meaning that in the middle point of the verse, the first verse and second verse, there's a chord change. And when the chord changes, the melody changes because I'll give you a good example as far as repetitious. And the reason being is, uh, Techno music. I initially didn't like it because I'm like, it's just a five minute boom, chicka boom, chicka boom. But as I studied it more, I understood that the purpose of most of those tech arts is just to make you dance. It's not about conveying a message in the lyrics or, you know, the beautiful arrangements and the horns and the violins in the background. It's not about that. So I can respect that because that's their purpose. That's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to be Motown or these other lavish types of arrangements, so I can respect that again. But uh, the majority of these songs today, and another one, because I just I did a cover on it, uh, R. Kelly, and I'm a big fan of R. Kelly, uh, All I Ever Wanted, off the TP.com album, uh, three, three chords. It's a five minute song, there's no changes of bridge, it's just five minutes of three chords. And to me, after 60 seconds, I get bored because I'm like, I'm ready, ready for the chord change or the bridge or whatever. And a lot of these songs, now they just do a variation of the drum beat to kind of change it up a little bit. They might kick out or drop out the kick drum or take out the snare for imagine and then kick it back in. The point I'm trying to make is young R&B songwriters study the grapes, you know, study baby face, study, uh, uh, the artists or the, the, the writers from the Motown era, you know, study Rick James, you know, because the, the more I learn theory, the more appreciate people like Rick James. I did a cover of a song called Dance by Gary's Gang. It's probably one of my all time favorite dance songs of that era because a couple of reasons. For one, it's a song that kind of just makes you feel good when you listen to it. Second, uh, the arrangement is just beautiful. The chord changes. Uh, the, the, just the overall arrangement, those guys were great musicians, the percussionists, the, all just overall, the song was a very good song. And I try to do a lot of those types of songs where I get these young, inspiring R&B songwriters say, man, I need to add more chords to my song because I got three chords here and I'm stretching them over a six minute period. And after a while, the, the listening goes brain dead, you know, cause, uh, we have a short attention span. So you like to kind of keep it moving as opposed to just a six minute, three chord song. And I'm not trying to bash the young people of today, you know, because I'm trying to encourage, you know. My thing is I try to put out positivity and I eliminate the negativity. You know, I'm not here to bash anybody or to say anything bad. I'm just here to kind of bring awareness as far as listen to the greats, the 70s music, the 60s, the 50s. Just study them if you're trying to be a songwriter or a vocalist or a musician and say, man, what are they doing? Because that's how I learned how to write my songs. I study Rick James. I'm like, what is Rick doing? Okay, he has an intro. Then he has his first verse. And then sometimes he has a B section. Then he has his hook. And then, you know, at some point in time in the middle of the song, he has a bridge. Meaning a different chord changes to kind of build a crescendo. And I don't really hear a lot of that in today's music. 
and a lot of people say, well, you know, the old music was the best music and, uh, you know, the, the new stuff is just, it ain't there. And that's up, that's, that opinion is, it varies to, from each individual. Again, I'm not knocking today's music. All I'm saying is study the grace and continue to keep uh, that alive as far as integrating that kind of arrangements into your song. Instead of, again, I'm just going to write a three chord song for six minutes and just let it run. And that's what I'm hearing today. And that's why a lot of people have a lot of criticism towards some of this music today because uh, it's just not, you know, how it used to be. Because, I mean, I listen to the Motown stuff, the Rick James stuff. There are three guitar players going in that one song. And they don't clash or they don't uh, crowd each other. Uh, these songs are carefully arranged where everybody, it could be a 10-piece band. And they are not uh, uh, colliding or crashing with each other. Uh, each individual uh, instrument is written a certain way where you can hear it distinctively. And I don't hear that in today's music. You know, what I hear is a big bass drum or big bass, a big drum beat, a bass line, a scent line that runs in and out, a little piano, and that's it. And again, I'm not knocking today's music. All I'm saying is let's try to keep the integrity of yesterday's music and integrate it in today's music. You can do your thing today, but just, you know, try to say, you know what, I'm going to sit down and write a song that has like maybe seven chords. You know, and I'm have a change or a B section in my song and see how that works. And most artists, uh, high level artists that are looking for songs from songwriters, they look for those kind of songs because those songs will last and never die. You know, they could be 20 years old, somebody put it on and people still enjoy and listen to it. Songs a lot of this stuff are going to be just a flash in the pan. You know, they, they get played today and then next year nobody even thinks about them and they just go into uh, obscurity. So... Basically, I'm going to wrap this video up, and as always, I thank you guys for coming to my channel. And again, the purpose of my, my channel was to teach the young guys the music of the 70s, and the music of the 80s, and music of the 60s, you know, because uh, those were some great times as far as music for us, and just in general. I think the 60s was my favorite era of music because everything was hidden on all cylinders. The Motown was kicking strong. Folk music was doing well. Rock music was just coming into its own. And blues was, you know, doing its thing. And of course, jazz. I do strongly suggest formal education as far as taking some classes to let someone that is very great or good at what they do and they teach you. There's nothing wrong with trying to figure out some things by yourself, but you don't want to be a dabbler. Trust me, you don't, because when it comes to music or any aspect of life, if you don't know your specialty or what you're doing, people won't take you serious. And then as far as music, uh, the more you know, the better off you are. If you can read, you can probably work until you don't want to work anymore. If you can't read and you're just going by air and dabbling, uh, not too many upscale recording artists or record labels are going to sign you because they want you to know your craft. That's my spiel. And I hope that this has been uh, informative and entertaining. And as always, I thank you guys again for your ongoing support and your subscription. Take care.